Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, so welcome to episode 34 of the Lifestyle Chase. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. I am joined by Marnie Ashcroft. So thanks for joining me. How yeah. are you doing today? Really good. How are you? I'm excellent. It's nice and sunshiny outside. I know. Isn't it beautiful? It is so good. great. We need this. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, when we're living in weather where it's like snowy and cold and there's no sunlight, like it affects people. It does. I know. There was that whole week where it was cold and also gray and I just, you could just feel it. It just kind of settles on us. In Absolutely. A so I want to know about the busiest day that you've had this week and just kind of take me through it from start to finish. What time do you wake up? All that stuff. Wow. Okay. Um, so I'm not like a super early riser. Um, I used to be, and I found that it just kind of wore me down because I do need to stay up later sometimes for my kids' sports or just because my mind is, is active later in the day. So I tend to wake up around seven. Um, first thing in the morning is me time. So I wake up and I have a coffee and I have my breakfast and I kind of lay out my day. Um, and then I get my kids up and get them ready for school. Uh, and that tends to be pretty busy until we get out the door. And I always schedule a workout first thing in the morning. So um, I found that it was really difficult for me if I delayed the workout or if I didn't you know, create space for myself to just kind of get that going. Uh, so I usually have a workout first thing. And then my day really, it, it's, it can be very different. So I guess my busiest day this week is where I try to fit in both meetings and spending time here with my team yeah. at the juicery. Um, because I'm always in a, in a mode of connection and business development. Uh, I really feel like it's important to stay connected to that part of your business all the time. So although I love the operational side and I love supporting my team and, and being you know f- client facing, I also really like that, that aspect of connecting with other business owners, entrepreneurs, um, sometimes it's our marketing team, that kind of thing. And so I tend to, to do a little bit of that. Um, for me, it's, it then sort of transitions again to, to the mom side of my life. So by three o'clock, I'm back on mom duty, picking up kids. I've got a really intensive sports schedule. Uh, my kids are in competitive soccer and hockey, and my son's on a basketball team now. So that's pretty nonstop in the evening. Uh, but I also try to go to events. I attended an event on Tuesday night that was incredible. Um, I really like to get out and do a bit of not typical networking, but just sort of connecting with other business owners and whatever that can be. Usually yeah. it's at an event or a panel or something like that. Um, and then it's back home and I have to get on my computer usually every single night for at least an hour or two to be responsive to emails because I do uh, oversee the entire company, right? So across the country, we've got requests from different owners, um, you know, checking website details, all of that stuff. So my day tends to not wind down until until quite late. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess the pace of that doesn't feel overwhelming to me. Um, it does ebb and flow. I do create times where it's not that busy. But uh, I think your question was busiest day, so that's, totally, a, that's totally. a snapshot of that. <laughs> <laughs> what are three non-negotiables that you schedule into every day? Uh, non-negotiables are uh, healthy food, for sure. So I always make sure that I've got, and I, I eat quite a lot. Um, people would be shocked at how frequently I eat, but uh, so I really like to plan that out. It's handy that I own a juice company and mm-hmm. I've always got snacks and, and fresh stuff being made, um, but it does take some planning because I also um, honor that within my family, right? So ensuring that we all have good things to eat. Uh, a workout every single day. I sweat for at least an hour. Um, on my dream days, I manage to fit in two. And um, the other non-negotiable I think is sleep. It's, it's really just, the basis of healthy living. Absolutely. Um, everything else can flow from that. If you take care of your of yourself and, and physically ensure that you know those base needs are being met consistently, I really feel like you can draw from a bigger pool of energy. Yeah. And then other parts of your life are more successful. What strategy do you put in place to ensure that you get enough sleep each night? Because some people they kind of like they mess themselves up. It's really tricky. I I'm not a perfect sleeper. Um, I, sometimes it's, um, you know, I need to watch a movie 
that I don't care about to kind of drift off to sleep. And sometimes it's just a good conversation, you know, with my partner, um, cuddling or reading books with my kids. And sometimes I take 10 milligrams of melatonin because my mind won't stop. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the season. It depends on so many factors, but I do have a bit of a monkey mind. It likes to, to think and it likes to do stuff late in the evening. And one of the things I've found that's linked to my sleep is my feeling of, did I do enough today? Right. And so sometimes as I'm settling down, I have to kind of run through my little list of, yeah, you know, you did a lot of stuff today. You, you're good. You can, yeah. you can rest. And I don't know if that's true for others, but that feeling of not being able to settle, I think sometimes comes from that place for me. I've heard a lot of people get a lot of value from like writing out all the things that they did. Yeah. And it's just, there's some science behind it to actually writing it yeah. versus like typing it or whatever. You just, you get to feel all that stuff and then see it on paper. Yeah. And acknowledge it for yourself and, and allow it to, to sink in because, um, and I, I think perhaps the folks that you're interacting with, um, are more driven in, in different ways that, that keep us from, from settling, from sleeping. And yeah, yeah. So it's, it's always a little bit out of reach, Yeah. but you gotta, you gotta work on it. Well, something that I find with, whether it's my clients or just peers or just people that I interact with, mm -hmm. we're really good at being hard on ourselves. Yeah. It's so like true. before we go to do a lift or before we go to do public speaking yeah, or anything. Totally. So we need to get better at being nice to ourselves. Yep. I agree. Absolutely. Cause the, the highest respect that we hold ourselves in is the most that we can give to others. Kind of it's thing. true. It's true. And you know, I was, I was listening a little bit last night to Brene Brown and um, it's within the context of parenting, but she talks about um, the concept of shame and guilt and how we hold on to those concepts for ourselves and also how we, we, you know, give them to our children and not even intentionally. Sometimes it's just through our actions, our expectations around being perfect or, or being enough. Um, and it gave me pause. I'm still kind of reflecting on some of the things she had to say, but I think a little bit of that is connected to the entrepreneurial spirit and wanting to be the best you can be within what you're creating. Um, and, and I don't know why we, we connect those negative emotions to it. It's, it just makes it more difficult, right? For sure. Yeah. So let's talk about kids, life with kids. What yeah. are like five qualities that each of your children, so you have two kids. I have two kids. All right. Each. Five, qual that's 10 yeah. qualities. 10 qualities total. <laughs> things that they've sort can. of taught you about life and things that have made uh, you better through them. Well, <clears throat> I really wish you would have asked me quest these questions in advance. Chris, I'm just kidding. Um, okay. So I think I'm learning different things for each of them. Um, my son is very much like me. And so it's very interesting to watch someone play out behaviors that you know you have yourself um, and, and what feelings you have around that. So I, I guess I'm learning through my son, um, patience, compassion, um, acceptance of, of who we are as people. I'm learning a lot about, you know, who I am as a teacher and as a leader. Right, because you gotta, you gotta, that that mirror is is right there for you. So um, I don't know if that's five, but that's a few. And uh, with my daughter, um, do you know she has a moral compass that is so strong, and she was born with it. She was born with the ability to see right and wrong, and not in a judgmental way, but in a, it it doesn't feel right. Like she will viscerally respond to something when she sees um, that something isn't right, and it's so beautiful to watch that in, in its purest form. So I protect that in her. If, if, if she's struggling with something, I often understand that it's coming from a place of she just doesn't understand because it's wrong mm -hmm. how that person is acting or how this person was treated or how this conversation unfolded. And, and, um, so that's really amazing. Um, and, uh, they're just, she's curious and brave and, and courageous. Like she'll put herself in situations that I remember as a child being like, I, I'm, I'm not, I can't, I can't do that. I can't go to a new school. I can't join a sports team. I can't make new friends, you know, as rapidly as she does is, is just really amazing. So, um, yeah, those are some of the qualities that I see in them and, and often I have literally no idea where they're getting those those qualities from but i'm sure that that some of them must must come from us right 
Yeah. yeah, it's totally cool, and I think it's neat to sort of reflect on these different angles that we don't often think about. Yeah, and just how different people, whether they're big people or little people, yeah. or young people or old people, they I always agree. affect us. Yeah. What was life like before you had kids for you? Um, it's, it's funny because sometimes when you're like, you know, buried in laundry and and uh, meal planning and running around doing all your things you reflect on like, what did I do with all the time that I had before I had kids? <laughs> ah, and you, it's not a feeling of resentment. It's more a feeling of like general wonder. Like how did I fill those, those hours? Because now there's so few. Um, I, I, I traveled for a year. Um, so all of Asia, um, I spent a lot of time um, in university. I worked really hard. I had a corporate job and I worked really, really hard at that. And when I wasn't in the office, I was out doing networking and, and spending a lot of time in those areas. Um, I definitely had more time to hang out with my, my family. I lived in Calgary um, for most of my like pre-kid years. So I spent more time with family and working out and, and doing stuff like that. And, and I think I just like went out for dinner and visited with friends and, and now there's just really no time for that. And I, I don't regret it, but I think that's the shift that parents experience and it, yep. and you struggle with it at first. Like at first you're like, I, I really wish we had more time. And then all of a sudden there's just an acceptance phase where you're like, this is just where we are right now. And it's temporary. We'll have different um, social dynamics. You know, I visit with families when we're watching basketball games or hockey games and things like that. But there isn't that sort of like really beautiful full social calendar that you used to have. Um, so I think those are some of the things that are that are different now. Nice, I like those. And I've come to take time as something that's a very valuable thing, whether it's paid time or podcast time. Like totally. this for me, this conversation is super valuable because like yeah. you're taking time out of your day to share with me. Thanks, Chris. And same, <laughs> I feel the same because, um, and I agree with you that time is precious and maybe that's one of the gifts that you receive when you have less of it is you start to really honor it. Um, and you start to become an incredible multitasker. You can do like nine things at one time. It actually is kind of my little personal game. Yeah. It's like, how many things can I accomplish simultaneously without breaking anything? Totally. Um, normally in like a home setting, right? But um, yeah, I, I do think that you start to honor time and you start to, um, you honor it in others too. I'm incredibly respectful of, of time that I request from, from folks and um, you know, in both a business and personal, personal way. Absolutely. So when you're choosing, you only have so many hours in a day and when you're choosing how to allot those hours, what are three rules that you use when you're like declaring, is this something I'm going to do or is this something I'm not going to do? A little bit of it comes down to the things that you know you should do within your business um, or personal life, right? So, for example, um, I always put my workouts every Sunday. I sit down and I put my workouts on the schedule for the whole week. Yeah. Um, I'm governed by Team Snap, and if, for those that don't know what Team Snap is, Team Snap is how all of my kids' sports teams um, schedule all the dates. So those are already there. So I, I see those things, right? So the kids have all of their sporting events and then I put myself on the calendar wherever I can fit. Um, one hour a day of, of workout because that's just what feels good for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then around that, I schedule all the work things that need to happen. So it's sort of how I prioritize and it's how I ensure that I never feel resentful of my business. I never feel as though it's asking more of me than I can give. And likewise with, with family, right? It's, it's, these are the things we really need to do and this is the stuff I need to do for me. Um, you know, people speak about self-care and, and what that looks like. Um, that will evolve more naturally if you don't neglect the things that, that are critical, Absolutely. right? And so, um, you know, for example, I only really have maybe two hours extra a week that I can kind of play with um, and I decide where those go. Yeah. Fluidly, right? That's awesome. Yeah. So you talked about travel, and how many how many countries have you been to? Can you name you them? You know what? I don't know. I've been to a lot of places. Like yeah. over 10, over 20? Oh, way over 20. Oh, so nice. Yeah. I love, passionately love, love, love travel. Um, so yeah, I've been to most of Europe. I've been to most of Asia. Um, traveled through Eastern Europe when I was at the end of university, and Australia, and all kinds of spots. Um, for me, uh, I'm always looking to, now I kind of try to align either an experience for the, the kids 
for travel or uh, something that's business related. So our plans for the spring include um, possibly a trip to Japan in May, which is going to be very exciting, and uh, a summer trip to Italy, and then um, some other plans that are kind of more family focused over the summer months. But it really does ebb and flow. And I mean, travel is expensive. And if you want to bring your kids, it's really, really expensive. But it's a, something we make a priority. Yep. And um, I think if you have a passion for it and putting yourself into those creative spaces of new experience and, and challenging those comfort zones, travel is, is just an incredible way to do that. I completely agree. Like travel, even if it's close and you're going to Jasper and staying in the hostel, yeah. like it's such a personal development tool. It is, Especially yeah. if you're open to the idea of like letting other people teach you things. Yes. Not going out there with your ego. But yeah. like going out there humbly and learning other people's cultures, yes, having I conversations, agree. yeah, it's valuable. It is. What's the longest trip you've ever been on? Um, we traveled for a year, so um, I was. We went through all of Asia and Australia, and we quit our jobs, and we lived on ten thousand dollars that year. That was it. That was all the money we had saved, and so we had to live on like fifty bucks a day. Um, so that was a huge challenge around comfort zones. Uh, I didn't love it all the time. It wasn't my favorite, um, you know, ex like climate wise, I'm a Canadian girl. And so there were times where I was really hot and really uncomfortable and the food wasn't awesome. And, you know, I, I could get into detail around what that looks like, but um, it was really incredible to see myself you know, now looking back, I was in my early 20s. Um, it's really a great way to figure out what you're made of. Yeah. And um, I don't know if the lessons I learned in that have come up for me and been able to sort of be used within parenting or business, but I definitely think there were some, some pretty huge knowledge points there. Absolutely. And what were your thoughts before you went on that trip? Because that's a big risk. It was a huge risk. It was crazy. Quit my job and everything. Um, just literally that I wanted to just be uncomfortable and, and see what the world looked like. I, I just kind of felt like I had to almost like it was like a, it was our destiny to just go out yep. there and, and check it out. Um, I don't know. You, you look at things been differently. You out of it a little bit. A little bit. That. There was delay and delay and delay. And, and originally I was actually, we were going to go to Africa and then there was a bombing. Um, and it was around the time that people were sort of getting a feel for what international terrorism could look like too. Like it was, it was quite sensitive times. And so there was a bit of fear around where we were going to go and what that was going to look like. And um, so we actually settled on Asia because we felt as though culturally it was a bit of a safer place for us to go during that time. Um, but yeah, I mean... Mostly the fear was around financials because in your early 20s, you're kind of thinking like, how am I setting myself up to buy a home or do I like, am I using my savings for this? I'm quitting a great job. Is that going to set me back on my career path? So the fear was around the things that, you know, culturally you're told are the right choices to make in that time period. And it seemed like that could maybe set some of that back. It actually didn't. It was pretty amazing how we were able to parachute back into a, a really great place in our careers and financially too. But we also were pretty strict on living on that ten thousand dollars for that oh, for, sure. for that year, yeah. and like that was like without compromise. So if that meant we only ate, you know, noodles, yeah, for two weeks, then we could afford to go on a scuba diving trip, for example, right? Like that was how we we lived, and those are life skills that I. Um, I think were really interesting to put into motion in real time like that. How did life change upon the return from that trip? Um, I was really ready to come home. A year's a long time. Um, it's funny, everybody would have like a sweet spot on how far away, you know, how far you want to be um, or how long you want to be away from from this life. But there's a lot of comforts of home, like just, just waking up in your own bed and having a coffee that you make yourself. So I was very ready to come home and um, create you know, what that looked like. And I was ready to have kids too. I was kind of thinking I was going to have my two kids by age 30. That was on the, on the map. Mm -hmm. So, um, it all lined up pretty quickly as soon as I got home. And, um, in a way it kind of settled the, the travel bug, you know, it, yeah. it was what I needed yeah. to, to put that to rest for a period of time. Um, it, it comes back, but I don't think I'll ever travel for that duration ever again. I, not in the foreseeable future, right? It, it's just, um, but I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad I did that. That's awesome. Yeah. 
So I want to talk about mentors in your life. And I want you to think of, let's say, four mentors, whether they be family, friends, people in business, not in business, that have really impacted you. And think of a few qualities that stood out about them okay. that made them influential. Um, okay, mentors. Well, I would say uh, one of my very first mentors will have to be my mom. She um, was a single parent bringing us up. Um, very difficult family economy. We really had to make it work as a team. And uh, my mom taught me a lot of stuff about what that looks like and responsibilities. Um, and she's also just an incredible role model. She surprises me all the time. She, <laughs> she comes up with, she sort of sees what needs to be done and quietly does it all the time. And that is a skill, right? Without, without ego, without anything around that, she just does the things that need to get done. Um, and she's of a generation that I think is just really hardworking and, and thoughtful. And I really love that. Um, I don't know if I can name four, Chris, to be That's very okay. honest. If you have these numbers, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> I just pick them around. So, right? Tell me nine <laughs> of your favorite. Anyway. Um, so, I think that uh, a few others would be within my family. Um, I have uncles that have been very, very successful in what they do. Um, that, have, that are leading organizations and... Um, you know, raising kids and, and doing it. My mom's from a very large family. She's one of 13. So we've got a lot of, um, just a lot of great intellectuals within our family that I can look to and, and learn from. Um, and we tend to approach parenting collectively sometimes. Like as a kid, I remember thinking like the lessons are coming from all over the place. They're not coming in any one direction. It wasn't just from my parent group that, that we experienced that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd say that there's, I don't have a firm mentorship pattern. Like there's no one person that mm -hmm. mentors me. I have often thought about whether I want to create that, but I have to tell you, Chris, I'm, I'm really bad with like too much structure. Like I love having the freedom to sort of ebb and flow. So what I find I often do is I'll reach out to other entrepreneurs that are doing amazing things and I'll just sit with them and we talk and there's that sense of sense of collaboration and and sharing that's very organic, very natural. You know, I don't assign the M word to it. Yeah. But I love it because I'm learning. Yeah. And I'm constantly learning. So that's sort of I don't know, maybe maybe it's just the world is is my mentor and I'm just out there being curious with it. It's a good mindset to be in, like to think of the world as like everybody can kind of be a mentor to you. They can. Like, yeah. My nieces can be a mentor to me. Totally. And a lot of guests that I have are obviously going to see their parents as mentors. Yeah. But I like to kind of find out what the answer is. So that's yeah. why I'll like blast a number out of them yeah. and see what comes. <laughs> well, it challenges you to think. Mm -hmm. Four is interesting because it does challenge you to think outside of that like little pod that is your family. Yeah. Um, but I, I sometimes I'm more attracted to an idea of collaboration, I guess, than mentorship, right? Mm -hmm. Even there's even been people that have asked me to be a mentor in their life or like alluded to it. And I feel so much pressure around that relationship as though I know more than you. Um, and I, I just I just don't know that even, you know, regardless of age or experience, I feel like we all have something to share. Yeah. Um, and that, that knowledge can be transferred without, you know, deciding who sits where you know in that in that relationship yeah like a lot of the people that who have taught me the best lessons they don't market themselves as a mentor or they don't talk of themselves as a mentor it's yeah. just like a genuine feeling of like compassion and empathy yes totally. and wanting to see growth in others yeah as like some of my friends have said like helping other people feels good yeah and supporting the learning because yeah. who knows what what it is that you can learn from that person right there's no there's no, and until the two of you are sitting together and connecting, you really don't know what that knowledge share is gonna look like, so. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a question that I ask a lot of my guests and it's, what was your high school experience like? Like what kind of a kid were you in high school? Um, high school for me was, so it's funny, I went to a, I grew up in Calgary and I went to a high school in Calgary that was um, in downtown Calgary and it was really multicultural and small so my graduating class i think was only like 250 students which by today's standards is a pretty small school um, what was incredible about it is that there was no 
there was a real sense of harmony in that school that I don't know is if it's typical or not, but um, I was in IB, I was in drama, um, I hung out with kids from every, from the sports side to the, you know, alternative kids to the whoever, there was no, there was no lines between them. Mm -hmm. It was really amazing. And it felt like a really safe place to be a kid. Um, and there was no judgment for, for who we were or what we wore. And uh, I loved it. It was great. I was challenged academically because of being in the IB program. And I took a lot of um, accountability for that because I knew it was going to kind of put me ahead in university. And that was an important um, goal for me. And within our family, it's really important to do well academically. So um, yeah, it allowed me the space to do that. I was also working um, part-time jobs. So I, uh, you know, I'd go to school all day and then I'd go home at night and I would usually uh, work at least one job every night. So uh, yeah, so, but I, I have no feelings of, you know, it was never overwhelming. It was never, you know, it was it was a it was a fun place to grow up. That's awesome. Yeah. What were your part time jobs? I worked in a clothing store, and then I worked in a shoe store, and I worked in a coffee shop. Um, sometimes overlapping, and sometimes just one of them. But um, yeah, it was really fun. I was always attracted to retail. I didn't know that. I guess I didn't really think about when I started Glow, I didn't really realize that those skills and that ability to connect with people and, and be in a retail environment would would lend itself so well to this. Absolutely. Um, but it has and it's and it's fun and it comes down to I think enjoying having conversations with people about what they're looking for and, and how you can find a fit for that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it may look superficial that that's a product focus, but I always saw it as fun and, and playful and enjoyable, and I was I was pretty successful. That's in those awesome. Roles. Yeah. So, what did you what did you foresee yourself doing when you're getting out of high school? Because I feel like you're the kind of person that you had it all planned. I out. did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very Stalinistic. I have like a five year plan <laughs> at all times. Um, so my path was you know, going to be that I went to university, I graduated with a degree, a Bachelor of Science degree, and I was going to end up in the area of geosciences, is what I thought was going to happen. Um, I don't have like a huge love of math um, and, and sciences, and I thought engineering might briefly be in my future, but it was too structured and not enough fun for me, literally. That's how I looked at my life at age 19. Um, so I was really attracted to geosciences, um, which was earth sciences mixed with a little bit of, you know, kind of the, the softer skills, the social side. And um, yeah, but then when I graduated, there weren't really jobs available at that time that I could see myself doing well at, at least not locally. Um, if I wanted to go work in Whitehorse and do like remote sensing stuff, or if I wanted to do, you know, field research in Banff, that was great, but I was a city girl um, and my friends were there and I saw myself living there. So I ended up getting into um, sales in a corporate IT environment pretty quickly. And business development is what I love doing. So it wasn't hard for me to fit into that space. But uh, that's kind of how life evolved. It really didn't um, go in an exact path that, that one would expect. Well, when it comes down to it, nobody's path is very direct. It's so true. Like they put all those yeah. memes on the internet and it's yeah. like, your path to success is gonna look up, down, up, down, up, down. <laughs> and it's true, that's the way it is for everybody. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I don't know, I, I feel as though it's good to stay curious with what you could be good at and mm -hmm. not you know, try things out. And then if they don't work, then try out other things like pivoting, right? That's like, that's a really important skill to, um, to kind of lean into and, and say like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I'm going to, but I would also, I was lucky because the, the corporate company I was working for, they did IT training, but they did project management training, business analysis training, um, leadership. So I got to drink a lot of champagne and decide exactly what I was going to do with that. So really what I ended up feeling that I was best at was the project management business analysis side. And um, although I didn't get a formative kind of certificate around those, those studies, I got to attend a lot of classes and, and look into that. And it was, it's been very valuable for me. Absolutely. What are some qualities that like the leadership in place had that made you a versatile employee? Um, it was a very flat organization. I actually just had a chance to sit down with my VP and I hadn't seen him in 10 years. 
and he was such a great leader. He provided me with opportunity to have my voice heard. So there was this one, uh, this one week where we were getting reports sent from head office and I was reading through the reports and I was like, I have to tell you, and I'm young, like I don't really know, I'm, I think I was 26 years old. And I'm like, I have to tell you, I feel like these reports aren't relevant to what we're actually trying to accomplish within the organization. We're looking at metrics that don't encourage behaviors that are gonna yield better better sales. And he was like, okay, do, do you wanna go to Toronto and, and tell them that? And I'm like, yes, I do wanna go to Toronto and tell them that. And that was scary. And he, we flew there and I sat in a boardroom with folks that were looking at, you know, what are our revenues? Where should we be selling more? Because it's a business development focused conversation. And I told them that I thought we were doing things wrong and how we could do them. And the room went really, really quiet and nobody said anything. And then I pulled out some reports and I was like, here's some other reports I've run that I think could be discussed as potential ideas for, and Nothing happened there, but about a week later, my VP called me and he was like, so that actually went really well in Toronto. And I was like, oh, thank God, because I thought you were calling in here, me here to, to fire <laughs> me. I thought I was done. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd spoken out of turn that I had made comments or, or uh, you know, suggestions that were going to be viewed as, as maybe inappropriate or, or out of line. And instead I got a promotion and I was encouraged to lead the business development team. And um, that taught me something, right? It taught me like step out of your comfort zone, um, speak if you feel passionate about something. I felt very passionate about that. It wasn't just coming out of nowhere and I wasn't saying it to impress anybody. I was saying it because I really felt it. And I think that's the difference, right? If you're in a corporate environment and you're, you know, you're, you're doing things because you think it's going to look good or you're ego motivated, it's not going to land in a good spot. Yeah. But if you're doing it because you really feel like it's best for the business, that's, that's where it should come from. So I guess that's what I learned in that is, is I got a really good you know, sign that that was good behavior. Um, but I was, I was so lucky to live in an organization at that time and it was a very special spot. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And it's a cool lesson that can be applied to almost any industry too. Yeah. Like if you're following something based on your intuition, you're doing something because you're passionate and yeah. you care about it, yeah. you're more inclined to seek out the knowledge to make you very, very good at it. Well, and within my company, if, if someone comes to me and they're like, I have an idea, I will praise them to no end. Even if the idea is crazy and it's not going to work, please generate ideas within a business. If you come to me and you're complaining about something or, and there's no suggestion of a solution, it just puts you in a very different light, right? So um, that, the fact that, that that kindness and that opportunity was presented to me um, helps me facilitate that in my own company all the time. That's good, that's yeah. awesome. When you're thinking of people that are on your team in any setting, whether it's like personal or professional, mm -hmm. what are a few qualities, maybe three or four qualities that yeah. you look for in a person? Um, I like when people are creative thinkers. Um, I think that you need to attract people that are thinking about ways that like they're and even during the interview process, right? So when I'm hiring somebody, I'm like, tell me a little bit about what attracted you to the company and why you see yourself fitting here. Like what, where, where's the synergy between you and this company? Because a company cannot define itself alone. It really can't. It can't grow. It can't become, it can't stay relevant. Um, if we don't understand who can contribute and how that can, that can affect that. So, um, that's one of the things I really look for. Uh, I look for accountability. I, things can go wrong and, and it's the same, you know, in, in my family too, with my kids, it's things are going to go wrong or we're going to make mistakes. Not, no one's perfect. Not even me, but I really like it when we can admit it as a team and then fix it, right? So come to me with, okay, this thing happened and I know that I did that and here's how I'm gonna fix it and it's not gonna happen again. It's a better conversation to have than throwing someone else under the bus or refusing to accept the fact that that happened because I think we're all, we all know, you know when someone's lying to you, right? You know it, you don't wanna know it and you might try to pretend that they're not but you can feel it on an intrinsic level when that's happening. And if it happens in your business, it feels even worse because you're really, you're tied to that person, mm -hmm. right? 
So um, accountability is, is, I think, connected somewhat to that aspect of trust and honesty and all those other really good qualities that, that people should have when they're working in a business. I like that. Those are those are good rules. Yeah. So, when you decided that you were going to start Glow, like I, I did a bit of homework. And okay. You, you kind of like you were driving around Sherwood Park and you noticed that there wasn't really a solution, right? Like, yeah. tell tell our listeners a bit about yeah. that moment. It's you kind of have to flash back a bit because um, you know the way that the food landscape has evolved and it is is amazing. There's so many more choices now, but mm-hmm. six years ago um, there really wasn't. There was you know the the big box fast food restaurants um, and the idea of fast food and healthy food there was a huge disconnect there um, I would actually go to a McDonald's drive through and only order apple slices because that was the only thing right so if we were really stuck for stuff and I couldn't get into a grocery store because sometimes you've got a couple kids in car seats right and and you can't unbuckle and do all the things so you know especially in these bedroom communities like Sherwood Park um, Moms are really tied to their cars and, they, and they're and they dependent on drive through at times. So I just wanted to make that easier. I wanted to, to give people an access point. And um, when I initially started doing research, that there was like 4,000 juiceries in the United States and there was three in Canada. So the minute you identify that, that'd be like you thinking to yourself, okay, wait a second. There's this huge trainer industry, right, in the States. Mm-hmm. And there's only three dudes doing this yeah, in Canada? totally. I gotta go, I gotta hustle. Yeah. So I sort of saw that and then It was coupled with um, the fact that people were experiencing challenges from um, cancer, critical care type stuff, and I knew that nutrition could be a big part of that. And I just didn't think there was an access point for people to to reach that. Like it was, it just, it it felt crazy that someone would have to quit their job to create juice for someone that they loved, right? To get them through that. So all of those things kind of landed together with some other research and I was like, okay, that's it. I gotta do it. I, I know too much. I have to act on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Like that's kind of, that holds you accountable. That whole feeling of, you know, like I know, yeah, I know too much. Like exactly. I have to do it. You can't. You feel I, like I am aware mm-hmm. of what could happen if I took that risk. Yeah. I am aware of my potential kind of thing. Or the regret if I didn't do it. Like That's so true. Right? If I didn't do it and then, and then I, I watched it evolve in a way that I wasn't comfortable with, I would always have that feeling of what if. And um, I mean, it's a very expensive what if to build a business. Yeah. <laughs> you have to know that, but you have to have confidence in yourself to accomplish it. And I think it's so neat that you talk about like the market and all that stuff, like how Canada didn't really have that much because not long ago I did a marketing job for a brand oh. called Press Juicery. Yeah. And so I was in Costco. I didn't know that. Press Juicery. It was, it was a short little That's stint cool, I Chris. did on yeah. weekends and stuff. Fun. And it was in addition to my old job. Yeah. But so I've, I've seen what it's like and I actually had someone yeah. walk up to me and they're like, I actually have a local juicery. And it wasn't, it was a juicery that I don't remember the name of, but it wasn't yours mm-hmm. and it wasn't probably anybody else that listened to the podcast. Mm-hmm. But in that moment I was like, wow, like, here I am promoting like California I know. and I could promote local. So that always, I remember that. And I think we I think are, I, I love the idea of promoting local. Like it's, it's a really important message. These are not, you know, and there's one message I can kind of, kind of give here is that these are tough times to be a business owner. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and I love that you're, you're speaking with, with small owners that have the opportunity to share their stories because it's really critical that we do. It's critical that we create connection with people that could choose to support us because it's not easy. Um, there's a lot of things working against us and uh, we overcome those all the time. That's my daily job. My daily job is to remove barriers, but sometimes I can't. Sometimes it's, it's too tricky. And so when people, you know, present their support to us through buying our products and and sharing our stories and and all of that. It means so much more than you could ever imagine because we've leveraged everything to to start this. Everything, right? And with with only risk. Who knows what that return could be? Yeah, we never know what we don't know. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So I have a question that I ask all of my guests okay. and if it's, if you could give one piece of advice to someone on how to authentically live their life to the fullest, 
what would that piece of advice be? Okay. I think that authenticity comes down to knowing what your core values are. Um, and no one can define that for you. And maybe that's what it's about. Maybe it's about defining what your life needs to look like to be happy because life is really short and it can be filled with all kinds of things you feel you should do. Um, but it can also be filled with the things that you want to do and that you know you're going to do well. And, um, I've been very blessed. I have never had a parent say to me, you're not good enough to do that. I've never had uh, a business role model say, uh, you, you can't accomplish that. I've never had a partner say that to me. You know, my kids look at me every day believing I can do anything. So those things haven't stood in my way when I'm defining what I think I'm capable of. But there are people out there that I think deal with those challenges. And in those instances, I think you just have to really lean into what your heart is telling you you do best and, and take some risks to get there. I like that. That's great advice. Thank you. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Chris. That was really fun. It was. Yeah. We'll see you around. Alrighty.